welcome to Dreamers to Leaders, Keeping It Real with Melody podcast. Melody is a born dreamer who started from being a flight attendant and worked her way up into now a tech fashion trendsetter, thought leader, and seasoned entrepreneur in multiple successful ventures. This podcast is for the awakened dreamer. Industry icons will share their humble beginnings up to the leaders they are today. Let's all learn and be inspired. Together, we can all prosper. Hello and welcome to the Dreamers to Leaders podcast. It's the podcast for the dreamers, but more importantly, the doers. I'm your host, Melody. If you're interested to learn more about the basic essentials of estate planning, this episode is for you. Joining us here today is attorney Grace Liu. She has her law firm in Manhattan Beach here in California, and she graduated from Georgetown University. Her bio will be posted and her link to her website will be posted somewhere in this episode. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome attorney Grace Liu. Hi, Grace. Thanks for joining us here today. Hi, Melody. It's so nice to see you again. Wonderful. Yes. So um, let's talk about estate planning 101. Why do you think it's important and how can you simplify the concept for our audience out there? Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of presentations um, on the topic of estate planning, and I've come up with um, eight estate planning must-haves. So um, it, you can, t- you know, stop me at any time. But basically, I think it's really important, you know, when you're thinking about doing your estate plan, to obviously have a will. Everybody knows what a will is, and they've, or at least they've heard of what it is. And um, you know, it's it's a document where you name executors to handle the distribution of your estate when you pass away. Um, And then obviously um, your, you know, you name beneficiaries within that will who will receive your assets. And in some cases, um, parents with minor children, they name guardians for their children within their will. So um, guardianship nominations can happen within the will or you can have a separate document for the guardianship nomination. So the only thing that you need to know about a will is that when when you do pass away, you will have to take that court or, or your executor will have to get to take, take that uh, document to a probate court to have that reviewed by a judge. And so what you're doing is opening up a process called probate. So if you only have a will, your executors will have to go through the probate process in order for your estate to be distributed. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, will versus a living trust, will will allow... Uh, it's going to be a, a headache uh, for the um, for the heirs because basically it will open it up for the courts to review everything in the will and open a probate. I see, I see. Right, and in, within a probate, you know, it's there's a purpose for probate, obviously. And I'm a probate attorney, and it's a methodical way for an estate to be handled. So there's a purpose to it. Um, and what a lot of families do is, you know, they they opt not to go through that probate process, and instead they create a family trust. So you just mentioned a revocable living trust, and so um, if you cr- if if you create a revocable living trust, then what you're doing is you're naming a trustee to manage your assets when you pass away, um, and uh, obviously you're doing the same thing. You're naming beneficiaries of that trust. And so if you put all your assets into this trust, upon your passing, your successor trustee who is managing your assets and um, getting them ready to be distributed to your beneficiaries, they don't need to go to court. We don't need to go to probate when you have a a trust set up because basically it's the trustees that are, you know, they have their own fiduciary duties to abide by the terms of the trust, to treat all the beneficiaries um, fairly, um, not to self-deal. So that's what these trustees are doing. So what we're doing with a living trust is taking uh, the control of the estate or the management of the estate away from the court system and putting it into the hands of a private individual, mm-hmm. meaning someone's trustee. So for our audience out there, probate is equivalent to headache. <laughs> Yeah, having headache, hassle, inconvenience, and it takes right. it takes forever. Uh, it does. I mean, I probate have... proceeding lasts uh, what nine months, or what is the average uh, probate proceedings? Um, you know, I, you know, for something even the simplest of probates, 
here in, uh, at least here in Los Angeles County, where I am, um, where I where I practice, it takes uh, about a year to a year and a half for the simplest of probates. Wow. You know, we're talking wow. maybe it's a sm little small bank account, but it happens to be over that um, um, the, the probate amount, meaning that it, it has to go through probate because it's not a small estate. So um, it, it, it takes a long time because there needs to be a hearing day to, to where, where the executives or the administrator is confirmed as the the one in charge. You have to make sure that um, a probate referee is appointed to, to appraise all the assets that are going through probate. So that's really, really important. And then accountings and a report have to be refiled, uh, filed um, periodically in order to finally close out the, mm -hmm. the probate. And then the distributions can be made to the beneficiary. So it does take a long time. So with, with probate, forget about privacy. There's there's no such thing as privacy. And you're allowing the state to basically uh, take over take over the assets well, of I mean, the, um, the deceased person, right? So uh, so even, even if it's just one thing that you have to consider about probate, that it's going to be a hassle, it's going to be a headache, it's going to take forever, and you're going to really lay it out there for someone else who doesn't give, um, doesn't care, <laughs> doesn't care about the welfare of the heirs, you're allowing them to basically nominate and designate and disperse your assets accordingly. Is that, is that right? Yeah, Melody, that's a great point about the privacy issue, right? Obviously, if someone has created a living trust and they've appointed maybe a child as, a, as their successor trustee or a close friend, um, that individual keeps everything private. When, you're in a, when you have to open up a probate to probate somebody's will, um, you have to file a list of all the assets that are going through probate and their values. So, and that's all public record um, for, for a reason, because if you're a creditor of, some, of a decedent, that creditor wants to know how much money you have. Um, they can still collect from the decedent. Exactly. So, so that's, that's, so it is, um, it is sort of a headache, right? To have, to go through this probate process there. I mean, there is a purpose to it. If you do have a trust and eventually you pass and there's some disputes between your beneficiaries or the beneficiaries and the trustees, you do wind up back in probate court because probate courts do have jurisdiction over trust disputes. But, but if all things go well and you've drafted your trust um, well and it's pretty clear, uh, then, then we can minimize the chance of having to go to probate court for a trust dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned... Um... Did you say revocable trust? So, so there's the revocable trust, there's the irrevocable trust. Why would one choose one versus the other? And what are the pros and cons? Yeah, that's a great question. Sure. Yeah, so I always, um, uh, for clients who believe that they, or, or I see a need for um, a revocable living trust, it's what we call you know, your basic estate plan. Everybody should, you know, who needs a trust really should have a revocable living trust because you can change it. You can change it. You know, once you establish one trust, you can use it for the rest of your life. Right. And so what I like to do in my practice is I tell my clients that I want to grow with them in five years. Maybe they'll have another child. Maybe, you know, their daughter will get married and they don't like the son-in-law. So there's a lot of things we can do, you know, with your trust as you go through different life stages. Um, the irrevocable trust also uh, is, it's a wonderful uh, vehicle. It also avoids probate. So, you know, because it's a trust, uh, there are certain, you know, it's irrevocable because, and meaning you can't change it because what people do who are creating um, irrevocable trusts, what they're trying to do is they're trying to minimize um, usually taxes, right? They're trying to reduce estate taxes um, federal estate tax. So um, the federal estate tax uh, right now is for each individual at 11.7 million. So um, a lot of people create this, these irrevocable trusts so that they can reduce their gross estate for estate tax purposes. You know, currently um, a, a, an individual has an $11.7 million estate tax exemption um, from federal estate taxes. And federal the federal estate tax is a tax on your death of all your property. So whether your property's in a trust, outside of a trust, 
If you're a U.S. citizen overseas, the U.S. government wants to bring in all these assets and see whether or not you have over 11.7 million for a single individual. And if you do, they want to hit you with an estate tax. So what um, if you're if you have assets around that amount, if you create an irrevocable trust, any assets that are held by this irrevocable trust, the IRS views as well, you don't have control over this asset anymore. It's in an irrevocable trust. Um, and so therefore, when they're trying to figure out at your death how much you have, they're not going to count those assets in the irrevocable trust. So basically, they exclude that amount for purposes of accounting for yes. what is due them, right? That's correct. Uh, so with, uh, with that exemption, the 11.7 million, it's a moving target. So um, how, how is that if, uh, let's say, next year or this year there's a new administration um, and if they change the, the exemption and it's an irrevocable trust, what do people do in, in cases like that? Um, if they really, really want to change that trust, there's always, you know, there's always a probate court. So you can always file a petition um, with uh, with the probate court asking for an irrevocable trust to be to be revoked, modified, <laughs> revoked, modified. So that there's that. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the time, people already name their children as beneficiaries. Let's say they have children of their irrevocable trust or a charity. Um, and if they are still okay with the um, the assets going that way, um, even if the estate tax exemption amount changes, then they kind of just let that be, right? Mm -hmm. So when they pass, eventually, you know, those assets in that irrevocable trust are just going to go to those chosen mm -hmm. beneficiaries. Now, um, we also hear a lot about AB trust. So um, can you simplify what that means uh, to our audience? Yeah, so an AB trust refers to a trust that a, uh, usually, a, well, for a married couple. A simple trust is a trust that a married couple creates. And upon the death of the first spouse, the surviving spouse can still make changes to that trust. And, um, and so they can amend it, they can revoke it. And um, it's, it's a really easy way for a couple to create to to create a plan and to um, have an entity because it's really easy to administer. It's easy to administer even after the death of the surviving spouse. Um, the drawback is there. They you know the surviving spouse can still make changes. So that could mean that the surviving spouse, assuming it's you know the wife, if she meets somebody who sweeps her off her feet. She may have that, well, she, she does have the ability to completely change the estate plan, which includes assets of that married couple. And she could give a distribution to this, you know, to somebody who sweeps her off her feet and perhaps is committing some type of undue influence or fraud, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's the simple trust. Um, again, you can change it at any time, mean, and the surviving spouse can also change it at any time. The AB trust is, um, is uh, a, a trust where it starts out as a singular trust um, established by a married couple. And on the death of the first spouse, the trust is supposed to split between an A portion and a B portion. Technically, the idea is that um, if all of the assets in the trust are community property, half the assets uh, will go into the B trust and half the assets are supposed to be allocated to the A trust. The A trust is technically technically the survivors, the surviving spouses portion of the trust estate. So they can do whatever they want. They can make it, they can make changes to that trust. They can change the trustees. They can change the beneficiaries. If she or he meets somebody that sweeps them off their feet, she, they can give all of it, some of it to that other um, individual. When it comes to the B trust, that technically is the decedent spouse's half of the estate. And that's, that becomes irrevocable. Mm. So the terms of it are irrevocable. Um, and so it's the B trust allows the spouse that passes away first to have more control because they're up in heaven looking down and they see that, well, at least my half of the estate has been, is irrevocable. My kids are going to be getting it. Not someone that sweeps my, my spouse off their feet. Wow. So that's the benefit of having a B trust. It is irrevocable. It does have to start filing its own income tax 
return, um, just the B part, um, the B portion. So there's some drawbacks um, to to that, you know, to that setup. But you know, some clients opt for it if um, if that's some if that's a concern of theirs that the surviving spouse may change the terms of the trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so with regards to um, power of attorney, so we hear that a lot, but um, but I don't think our audience or a lot of the or the general public have really an idea on what a power of attorney really is. What yes. is it? Uh, Grace? Yeah. And um, so a power of attorney is a um, instrument that, and there's two types there, you know, it's, there's a durable power of attorney for finances, and there is a durable power of attorney for medical decisions, also known as an advanced healthcare directive. So if we're referring to the uh, a durable power of attorney for finances, if you lack capacity to make your own financial decisions, what a power of attorney allows you to do is to appoint an agent while you're incapacitated to manage your finances, right? To maybe access um, your bank accounts, um, to, to sign legal documents on your behalf. So that's what a power of attorney uh, uh, allows allows you to do allows you to make decisions when you're when you don't have capacity because somebody else is stepping into your shoes to do that for you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now uh let's switch uh gears a little bit uh with regards to life insurance so life insurance have uh their own uh, beneficiary clause right mm -hmm. and um how does that play out with um with the same named owner of the life insurance also having a trust and if they have their own beneficiaries and trustees in their own trust which would take uh, precedent yeah uh, that's a great question case. melody um because and this is something that i try to really drill into my clients um that there are there are some assets like life insurance like an ira a Roth IRA, a 401k plan that when you cr open it, when you open up these policies, you're given a beneficiary designation form. And that form is how um, is, is, is uh, lists the beneficiaries of that asset. Mm -hmm. So if you have a will or a trust and you name your children as beneficiaries, and then you have a life insurance policy and you filled out the beneficiary form, the beneficiary designation form, and you named a charity mm. as a beneficiary, at your death, that life insurance policy is gonna go directly to that charity because these types of assets are uh, creatures of contract. So they're going to be, they're not, they're gonna ignore your testamentary documents, which are your will and your trust. And they're just gonna go directly to whoever you named as the beneficiary. However, you could always name your own trust as a beneficiary of your insurance policies to kind of meld it all together, right? To kind of streamline everything so that if you named your trust as a beneficiary, um, then your trust would be the beneficiary and the proceeds of the life insurance would run through the trust and be dis and maybe there's some contingencies that you have in your trust, right? My kid has to be 25 before they get their first distribution. Um, or my um, my son has to finish uh, finish his drug rehabilitation program um, and show evidence of sobriety for five years before you make distributions to him. So things like that, mm -hmm. those would have to run through. You know, they could run through the trust if you named the trust as a beneficiary of these policies. Mm -hmm. Do you also see or recommend uh, others to have their trust as the owner? Of, uh, of the life insurance? Yeah, so for, uh, you can do either. You can, you know, if you want to still name that charity outside of your, uh, out and not name your trust, just know that that charity will, will be the beneficiary of your life insurance policy. So that's, that's fine. Um, I do recommend if you have minor children to name your trust as a beneficiary of your life insurance policy. Hmm. And the reason why is because usually if you've had, you know, if you worked with an attorney, you've created this trust, um, you're going to have a trustee that's going to be managing these assets 
for your kids, mm -hmm. right? So if you're, you know, if your kid is still under the age of 18, you have somebody that you've nominated as your successor trustee that's going to be managing those assets for your for your children until they turn a certain age. The problem with naming your children straight up on uh, the insurance policy is that if you pass away and they're still minors, the insurance company won't release, a, a lot of insurance companies, at least the ones that I've worked with, don't release those funds until a guardian is appointed to receive those benefits for your child. And how do you become a guardian? It's not that you just raise your hand and say, well, I'm the parent, I'm the guardian. Even if you're the parent of that child, you have to go to probate court here in California. You have to be appointed as, you have to open up a guardianship proceeding in probate court, be appointed as your child's legal guardian in order to actually have the insurance policy monies released to your guardianship account. Because the courts wanna make sure that as a parent, they have oversight over you as the guardian because you're managing a minor's assets and they don't want you to self deal um, or mishandle th those minors assets. So that's why insurance companies require that there's a guardianship um, proceeding that's that's opened and up in probate court. And that's, that can be really expensive. So long story short, name, if you have minor children, it's better to name your trust as the beneficiary of your life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. In terms of assets that need to go to uh, uh, someone's trust, what would you recommend be the assets that need to be included in the yeah. trust? Absolutely. Um, real property. So your primary residence, any rental property that you have, we transfer um, businesses. So we assign business interests into trusts. We assign um, all your tangible personal property, your jewelry, furniture, um, pieces of art, expensive art, you know, all into the trust. Um, so, those are the types of assets that, oh, I'm sorry, and bank accounts. Bank, bank accounts that are in your own name should be transferred into the name of the trust. What we don't transfer during your lifetime are your retirement accounts. So if you have a pension, a IRA, 401k plan, those stay in your name during your lifetime. We do not transfer those. We don't retitle those during your lifetime into the name of the trust. However, you can fill out a beneficiary designation form so that you can state at your death this this 401k you know uh, the proceeds of the 401k can go to your trust so again i hope that makes sense during your lifetime these types of retirement accounts stay in your individual name they don't go into the trust but you can always say okay well at my death i want the proceeds or the remaining amounts of these um uh, assets to go into my trust. Mm -hmm. What uh, type of life events uh, would trigger maybe amending or updating uh, your trust or making sure that one is set up? Yeah, um, I actually did a presentation on this before. And I want to tell you, it's all different types of stages. I have, you know, ch I have clients who are who have sent their kids to me who are about to go to college and the college students, you know, they, they're going to be going to college far away and they, they need an advanced healthcare directive in case something happens to them, you know, in, in college and they need someone to make healthcare decisions for them. You know, the kids are over the age of 18. And so, um, so even starting as young as college age kids, they need to have an advanced healthcare directive in place. People come to me when they're about to buy their, their first home. So they want to get their, you know, their house set up and, and, and have a trust. Um, maybe a parent passes away. And so they're about to inherit some, you know, a great deal of assets or not, but they need help um, administering the estate. And then from there, they realize that they need, they want to make sure that they want to um, have a really, really, really smooth plan in place so that they don't become a burden on their loved ones later on if they, if they pass um, so, uh, marriage, people, you know, getting married or about to get married, um, about to get divorced, um, or getting, you know, just got divorced. Uh, they will also come to me because now we have to redo the, you know, we have to set up a, a different type of plan. Um, kids are getting married. 
they don't like the son-in-law. Let's, you know, we're doing all these things to shelter um, assets that belong to their kids. Uh, and then obviously I have clients who wait a long time and they don't do their plan. Um, and, you, you know, they, they're, they're really, they, they have capacity, um, but they're, they're really like just, you can tell it's, they don't have that much time left. And so we will do that plan as soon as possible for them. When listening to you, I was curious, do you know of any high profile that are that have been really out there uh, in the media of those high net worth uh, people that have uh, that passed without any any uh, trust uh, that they have set up? Anyone that you could think of top of your head that, oh my God, this high profile uh, celebrity or high, high net worth uh, business tycoon has all these assets yet no trust. Do you know of any any um, any news like that? Because I know that there were a few cases that uh, we we studied or were part of um, like case analysis, you know. Um, but I just can't think of. <laughs> those yeah, I can't moment. think of any either. I just know that anytime you're going to have a you know a lot of wealth, even if they did have a plan set up, there's a lot of litigation involved. Right. A lot of times there's people wondering if there was a, you know, first of all, how do you interpret what was written and um, what was their intent? Oh, well, look, there's another version of this trust and I have it. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of litigation that surrounds this 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 area. Um, and uh, but I've definitely had, you know, had to probate a very, very wealthy estate, not a celebrity. I mean, but, and, and, you know. And they had nothing. They had no, they didn't, you know, maybe they just wrote a letter saying, I wish that this is what, this is what would happen upon my death. And that doesn't constitute a will, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and if someone doesn't do any planning, we are in probate court because the probate court does handle people, you know, estates where there was no will, right? That happens all the time. The one th thing that I do want to mention, Melody, is that I have lots of clients who, you know, maybe they prepared, um, or I should say, they brought trust into me um, and you know, their parents have passed away. And we realized that even though the parents had a trust, they never funded, you know, they didn't fund their trust correctly. So they had a piece of real property that they never retitled in the name of the trust. And I'm going to probate despite the fact that they had a living trust. Right. So right. even if you have a trust, that's great, but you want to make sure that it's really, really funded correctly. That and is an extremely, important. extremely important point. Um, yeah, I think I, I know a lot that could be guilty of that. You know, they check off that that proverbial uh, box, right. Right? right? That you've done your living trust, but right. there's it's a living document that you still have to make sure that you update accordingly, especially as you acquire as you acquire more uh, properties. Bottom line is making sure that. Really, A, you have a kid. Two, you have a property regardless. Three, um, what, what would be... But you have a business. If you have your own business, you, have you your should own, make sure you have your that own that business. is... Yep. Um, it's super important to make sure that that document, uh, that your trust is in place. So then it, don't, it doesn't go to probate and it doesn't um, create all these uh, fiasco that you wouldn't really want. Right. right. Um, uh, now, with regards to um, uh, the recent changes in, in, in the law, right? So proposition, I think proposition 19 has has a lot to do with with some consequences uh, to estate planning. Uh, can you um, can you educate us more about what is the repercussion of that proposition uh, in estate planning? Yeah, so. Since 1986, California has had this really special um, benefit for any time uh, parents want to transfer any real property to their children. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about real property, I mean land, homes, um, things of that nature. And um, basically whether a parent, so when we're talking about a parent's primary residence, a you know, since 1986, a parent has been able to give their property, it may be during lifetime, or even at death to their children, and the children could pay the same property tax rate as mom and dad. 
So what, what, what we mean by that is that transfer is not reassessed for property tax purposes. So that's always been a wonderful benefit. You could have a, a $5 million home, and if you pass it down to your child, they still pay the same amount of property taxes as you. Instead of getting reassessed as of the date they receive the property, um, and so that's been a wonderful ben benefit. Um, also, since again, 1986, and again, I was just told it was 86, I, I'm not positive, but um, you know, if you have rental property, you can transfer your rental property to, to your children the same way. There's just a limit and there's a $1 million limit in terms of the properties that you can transfer. And it's based on the assessed value, not the fair market value, but the assessed value, which is the value on your property tax statements. Um, so, you know, as long as you have properties um, that, uh, a property that's under that $1 million assessed value, you can transfer that property directly to your child. Um, and you can also obviously add other pieces of real properties and you can just let the county know how much of that $1 million exemption you wanna use for each property, but it's a total limit of, a, of $1 million. So, um, so that, that's been the benefit, um, but because of Proposition 19, which passed in November, that completely has changed this, the scheme of things. I mean, a lot of my work has always been, okay, I just need to make sure I, I make, you know, I preserve the property tax benefit yes, for, yes. you know, my, my clients. I'm always like really wary. Okay. Is this a parent child transfer? Is this a parent child transfer? Because I want to make sure that I lock that in because if I don't claim it, it I lose it. Um, but now starting February 16th, Proposition um, 19 goes into effect and basically the, the new rule is that uh, when a parent transfers their primary residence to a child, yeah, the child can still have the that benefit, but the child has to move in to that property within a year and claim that as their primary residence. And of course, the problem is most of the time when parents are contemplating this, the children already have their own homes or maybe don't want to live there. So that's the problem. And so, um, you know, after February 16th, if, you, if a child inherits mom and dad's home, they will be reassessed. You know, they're gonna have to pay a higher property tax rate if they wanna hold on to that property, unless they move into that house and claim it as, that, um, as the child's primary residence. Mm -hmm. So that's, what, that's, the, that's the, new wor the new world, I should say. And when it comes to all of the parents' rental property, all of that, anytime rental property or income generating property, what I mean, non-primary residences are passed down to the kids, whether through gift, lifetime gifting, or through death, there's going to be a reassessment. There's no, there's nothing else, you know, there's no $1 million, you know, exclusion from reassessment exemption. It's going to be reassessed. Mm -hmm. So, so to wrap it up, um, Grace, what would you what would you say to our audience who want to um, to DIY their will or their yeah. trust? So, uh, especially especially now, you know, it was popular, and I think it still is popular yeah. to use like a legal Zoom or those type right. of uh, vendors, where right. pretty much they do most of it, and they and the vendor just prepares. Uh, the document for them, uh, as opposed to having a reputable uh, estate lawyer uh, to, to assist them with drafting the, the trust. Right. What would be your say on, on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I've taken a look at some of, you know, um, these do it yourself documents and, you know, they work. I, I've, there's nothing wrong with them and they're, they're functional. Um, and, you know, I have plenty of clients. I think what happens is they, you know, they, they will do these, um, they will go on to legal zoom, they'll create their documents, but they always have this lingering feeling at the end. Like, I'm not sure if I did it right. And so, because they're doing it on their own and, you know, there are some people who, you know, are really, really savvy. They, they really, you know, have studied up on the topic and sure, if they want to spend all that time to kind of get up to speed on all the nuances um, of estate tax law, gift tax law, property tax laws, income tax laws, and understand how, you know, everything in the world of probate works. 
um, then yeah, sure, you can you you can absolutely you know make those types of documents work for you. I think the benefit of working with a professional is that you can you know you you know if you choose the right law office, they'll be able to, they'll get to know you, they get to know your family, um, well who your family members are and they will be there for you like a family office whenever you need them, whenever you need to, you know, kind of ask them about, um, oh, should I put this property into my trust or how should I fill out this beneficiary designation form? They're always there. They'll grow with you. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's somebody there to, to understand what your intent is, how you really want your estate plan and for them to craft it exactly the way you want. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's sort of the benefit, I think, of going with a professional versus doing it on your own. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Like I've seen the actual documents and they're, they're functional and they, um, but I think a lot of times my clients are left, you know, the ones that do go through that process, just, just like, they always want me to kind of double check or they're just not, not sure if they've done it correctly. And there's other issues too. Like you can create a trust, but through legal zoom, but maybe you didn't know to fund it. So that's another issue, right? So you need to have, it helps to have a legal professional remind you We've created this document, you know, we've, we've sat down with you, gotten to know you, understand like the issues that your family's facing. Um, and what we wanna do is, um, you know, now that we have it, we wanna make sure you use it. And so make sure you go to the bank and retitle this account in the name of your trust. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you have, if most attorneys that I know that are in this field, they will prepare the deeds and record the deeds so that your real property is in your trust. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's important. So for our audience out there, uh, I think that's a good caveat, you know, uh, especially with, with the saying of being a uh, penny smart, but uh, pound foolish, uh, especially if you're, if you if you've passed, you want to make sure that what you, what you have done and set up actually will execute and will do exactly as you have, uh, wished or desired uh, for it to happen, right? Yeah, there's a greater uh, chance of that happening. I'm sorry? There's a greater chance of things going um, more smoothly when, if you've had a professional help you create the document. Exactly, exactly. As they say, there's a lot of things that you could skimp on, uh, but when it comes to um, you know a good lawyer, a good doctor, even a good insurance, those things, um, you want to make sure that, you know, just skip on other stuff, uh, but make sure on, on those three, uh, on a good financial uh, financial planner, um, you know, don't look at cost per se, but really qualification. And if it means you pay a little bit more, then you pay a little bit more, but you get the quality. Uh, and there are some things that just, you just don't want to compromise. Right, Grace? Right. I agree. Is there anything else uh, aside from what I have asked you that you think, you know, while we have this platform uh, that you you think I should um, that we should talk talk about? No, I think you were, you know, you, you definitely did an amazing job um, and came up with some wonderful questions. I think that um, it's always important for individuals to to recognize um, their mortality and it's a, it's a hard topic. Like nobody really wants to think about uh, their legacy and uh, that they could go at any day, you know, any time. Um, and so it's hard, it's a hard topic. Um, I've often had clients that come into my office and just talking about um, this issue brings tears to their eyes. And so it is a very, um, it's a very important issue. It's a very emotional issue. It really, really makes you really think about how you want to lead your life really right. going forward. So I think that the estate planning process is a wonderful way to, to reset and to see, you know, how you want to yeah, live the rest of your life and how you want to steward all the blessings you've been given in your life. So that's the only thing I want you know, just listening to you, it just dawned on me that there are, that there are those that actually opted to do like a video, like uh, leaving a recording of their wishes 
and even naming uh, who they want to be the beneficiaries, their heirs, percentage of this asset to go to, to which party, and then ending with uh, their, their parting message. How is that compared to, have you encountered anything like that where now it's in probate because it was just a video recording? Yeah, unfortunately, like that are usually it's a supplement. To- uh, that's right. You you know, the videos are used as extrinsic evidence of somebody's intent, but they don't replace a will or a trust. Um, sometimes they're just used to show that the testator or the client had capacity when they were doing um, their documents. And um, but obviously, yes, it, it goes to if they want to talk about their life story or the reason why they're leaving their estate a certain way, it might bring some clarification, but it, it is, it's again, used just as an, as extrinsic evidence only if there is a dispute Mm -hmm. um, as to, as to whether or not we need to clarify something in the actual four corners of the documents. But usually we just look at, the four corners of the trust document or the will to determine how the estate should be distributed. Mm-hmm. Hey, Grace, um, you have shared a lot of really relevant uh, information to our audience. So I just really want to thank you uh, for your your time and, and, and generosity of your um, skills and expertise. So thank you once again and uh, wishing you continued success. Thank you so much, Melody. I really enjoyed being on your show. Wonderful. And uh, for all the dreamers out there, keep believing. You got this. Till next time.